the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here, author of the Cannabis Business Book, and you're listening to the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, where I chat with and coach the highest performing entrepreneurs in the cannabis industry. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here. And on today's episode of the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, I'm joined by Mark Doherty, who, before introducing your kind of formal title, I want to share a quick story about Mark, uh, which is once upon a time back when events were a thing, (laughs) must have been two or three years ago now, you spoke on a panel at one of my High and Why events. And it was a rare instance in which my mother was present and in the audience. And I remember she came up to me after the panel and she said to me, that guy's good. He should be your mentor and referring (laughs) to Mark. So, you know, that was a, a, a big endorsement and you know, I'm trying to grow cool facial hair like Mark as as one step, <laughs> you know, one step towards mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. towards the mentorship. But you know, I'm I, I realize that I have to fail forward in that endeavor. So you know, it's a work in progress. But on a more serious note, Mark is the executive vice president of operations at Urban Grow, and I want to double check on that title with you, Mark, because literally, like. For the last several years, every time I've reached out to you or connected with you, your title has changed and you moved up in the company and you're doing something different. So Mm -hmm. is that, am I accurate here or? It is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is my title, uh, EVP of operations. And um, I think first and foremost, we have to address the facial hair comment because that's, we can't leave people hanging. Hopefully there's going to be some video that comes of this podcast or gets posted on social along with it. And then people will see that you are well on your way, my friend, to uh, some serious facial hair. Nice. Uh, and you've got me beat because I'm going gray quickly. In fact, you know, speaking of mothers, right, we, I got a good endorsement from your mom. My mom likes to say, you know, honey, if you would just shave that thing off your face, no one would know you're going gray. <laughs> so that's, that's her, my, you know, my mother's story. But uh, nice. But yeah, uh, EVP of Ops. So, you know, it's been a, an evolution, right? I, I, I think back to when you and I first met, which was before that high NY event, which was like four, almost four and a half years ago, probably at a small function in New York City. And I remember just connecting with you, like having a coffee, standing in the lobby uh, of this event and just connecting and you telling me what you were up to and what you were developing with high and why and, and all these things and us just sort of, um, you know, making a match, right? Like we just connected and it was awesome. And uh, you're one of those guys that um, has that, that vibe about you that is attractive uh, to so many other people. And you've, you've shown it with what you've built uh, and, and everything. And it's just been amazing to kind of be a small part of that, or, you know, a bit of a fly on the wall to watch your progression. Um, you know, as well. And, and mine with, with Urban Grow has really just been sort of this evolution of the company and just taking on whatever responsibility was presented to me in that moment and saying, hey, yeah, I want to do this or I want to do that. Um, and being lucky enough to work for a company that is rapidly growing and expanding. And they're like, okay, you want to add that to your, your job duties? Sure, go for it. And uh, allowing me to really, really grow with the company has been awesome. Amazing. Well, first of all, thank you for those really kind words. I appreciate that coming from you, Mark. And um, I guess, can you give a little more detail about the work you've done with Urban Grow and uh, almost, I guess, the pre-COVID day-to-day? Sure. So, you know, for a little over four years ago, when I started with the company, I was living in upstate New York which is where I'm originally from. And I was working as a director of sales, really building the market, uh, you know, on the East Coast for Urban Grow. And that was, you know, as states like Massachusetts and and New York and and states out there were starting to really come online, building cultivation facilities, 
Urban Grow's uh, forte is design and engineering for cannabis cultivation. And what we really started out as, though, was an equipment reseller. Uh, it really started six years ago with just an equipment reseller of lighting, uh, so grow lights, and then has grown into what it is today. Um, so I was doing that out east, and the projects that we were bringing on on the east coast were different than what had been experienced up until that point. And they were different in that there was a different investor mindset that was being brought to the project and a different level of experience with large scale design build and engineering projects. So, you know, I'd sit at the table as a, you know, provider of these, these products or these uh, pieces of equipment that were cultivation related. And I'd be sitting across from engineers and architects and, and construction crews and general contractors. And I'd say, Hey, yeah, well, what was the last project you guys worked on? And they'd say, Hey, you know, that hundred billion dollar casino down the road. Yeah, we built that, you know, and here we are building a grow together. And it was like, all right, we had to step up our game in order to play in that space. And so I started to take on the role as really a project manager for the company. And that was the beginning of my evolution from really sales over to operations. Uh, eventually, I took over uh, management of the uh, design and the engineering and then procurement and then account management. And then that's what grew into what I do today for the company um, is really all that back end logistics management of those various departments, um, you know, things like warehousing and things, you know, shipping and receiving and all these things that are just kind of always in the background uh, that people maybe don't see. Uh, you know, or feel until they go wrong, really, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as the change, nothing has really changed a whole lot uh, for me with the COVID uh, situation, other than my staff, for the most part, is working from home. Uh, and we are meeting, you know, like we are over Zoom or, you know, Google Hangouts or whatever it may be, uh, and just really trying to stay connected. Uh, that's really been the that's been the interesting thing for me, right, is how do we stay connected as a team? How do we stay connected as, as people, right, as, as coworkers and just individuals who are giving their best every day to the company and then also dealing with this reality of this sort of strange world that we're living in right now, you know, but as far as just day-to-day -day operations, I've been really just amazed at, at my team that they haven't missed a beat. We went from, okay, everybody works in these two offices to, okay, nobody but Mark and the warehouse guy work in an office uh, and everybody else is from home and they didn't, they didn't miss a beat. It's been pretty awesome. Wow. Very cool. Well, I have to say that it's, it's awesome that to hear a little bit of the story of how you've evolved with the company and with the industry really. And I, I heard um, one thing or two things in there that I want to highlight one is saying yes to additional responsibility and additional work and additional opportunity and, you know, seizing that opportunity. And the other thing I heard was, um, you know, stepping your game up and recognizing when you are in a different room with people from other industries mm -hmm. who are, you know, you know, at a high level in their field, letting that motivate you and inspire you to step your game up and to do things differently and to, to, I, I'm assuming learn from them or, you know, or just look to see the way they were doing things and incorporate that into your game. So I, I think that's for anyone listening. Those are two things that will, will go far in any profession, career, entrepreneurial venture, whatever it may be, or in just in life generally, is, you know, if you take on more responsibility and challenge yourself to level up and to grow over time, you'll get good results. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I always look at it like, um, I'm always interested to learn something new or to have an experience I've never had before. And most recently with taking over, you know, a few new divisions as of January of this year, I mean, one of them was, was warehouse and procurement. And that's something I didn't have a lot of experience with in the past. And I've learned a ton, right? I've gotten the opportunity to work with companies in China and companies in Israel and companies in Switzerland and 
companies in in Holland and and you know uh, all over, right? And just the like, how do you formulate an email? Basically, saying the same thing, right? Something as simple as how much is this product going to cost me? What kind of terms can you offer me? These types of really simple, simplistic things. I really had to learn that like a, an email going to a representative in China is going to need to be phrased completely differently than one going to someone in Amsterdam. Mm. Asking the same exact question, right? But if I want the result I want, uh, I need to learn that piece of it. And that's been fascinating for me. And that's not necessarily, you know, cannabis related, but it's still part of our industry. We have to procure equipment. We have to move product from A to B. Um, and it applies to a lot of other things. But yeah, just saying, yes, I'll take that on has, has been huge um, for me. Wow. So that's really, really interesting also that you have to kind of take the same exact I guess, message and crafted in different ways for different audiences, um, you know, accounting for cultural differences. And I think that that's, you know, it's really interesting for me because I've found that I've, I've said for years that with cannabis education, you know, the facts are the same, like mm -hmm. the, the message, the science, whatever the history, it's the same across the board, that's constant. But when you're explaining that to a grandmother or senior citizen versus a college kid versus, you know, someone from Jamaica versus someone from the Netherlands versus someone from the Midwest, you know, you're gonna have to use different framing and language for the message to resonate. And it, it sounds like given your new role and, and also just, how the industry has changed to be much more international these days than mm -hmm. I think it was, you know, say four or five years ago, those considerations, those kind of high touch communication and professionalism things are becoming much more important to, to operate effectively. Is that, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, and that is the thing, right? It's become way more international. Uh, I think that's that's one of the big changes uh, that I've seen, and, and that we you know we are uh, dealing in projects right. Like we have a project, a couple of projects right now in Switzerland that we're dealing with, and the the nuances of doing business there versus anywhere else, right? It's all just a little bit different, and it is the same end goal, the 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 production of a, a high end product uh, in the most safe and cost uh, effective manner possible. Right. But, um, you know, the, the learning curve has been <laughs> steep and rapid uh, in, in, uh, in this business. I always the phrase I you know, used years ago that I love to go back on is that the, the cannabis industry is aging in dog years. Right. So it's been like 28 years since you and I first met. Uh, and sometimes it feels it. <laughs> <Right. You know? laughs> Probably what's contributed to the, the gray beard. Nice. Yep. 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 Awesome. Well, Mark, I want to ask you, was there a moment for you when it all clicked and you decided to go all in on cannabis or you discover that, you know, this is it, this is the path I'm going to take? If I go way back in, in my history, all the way back to Paul Smith's college in upstate New York, I was an 18 year old kid fresh out of high school. I was taking an English class. And I was not the best student back then by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and <laughs> I had this English class uh, and, and a great, really great teacher. And I had to write a paper. I think it was an English class. Anyway, I had to write a paper for this class. And it's the night before and I hadn't done it. And I, I knock out this terribly written paper on why, you know, cannabis, uh, I'm sure I didn't use the term cannabis back then. Um, it was not the parlance of our time as, as the dude would say. But, you know, it, I, I, on legalization, right? Why it should be legalized. And the teacher calls me to his office the next day and he throws it down and he says, this is garbage. I won't accept it. And I said, well, you know, why not? He says, listen, it's not really well written. He says, which I can get over. But he says, if I get one more uh, paper on this, I'm just going to lose my mind. And oh, by the way, it'll never be legalized in our lifetime. 
And I'll never forget that because I really did believe it back then. I really, you know, wanted for this back then. But then, you know, fast forward, of course, you know, his prediction has proven, I guess, somewhat incorrect. Although, you know, we'll see how things turn out over the next few years. But, you know, I got into controlled environment agriculture. I caught a bug uh, called controlled environment ag. And what was happening was I had um, I'd been working in restaurants my whole life is all I ever knew. I'd gone back to school and eventually gone back to grad school uh, in my mid, mid 20s and late 20s. And I was reading an article about a group uh, that built an indoor aquaponic farm. And I became fascinated with it. And I started to explore that. And I ended up opening uh, an indoor aquaponic farm where we were growing lettuce and basil. And really my passion that's developed is I love growing plants indoors. Uh, I get a kick out of it. I, I love the equipment. I love the um, the, the million parts and pieces that you have to put together to make these things work and building these indoor ecosystems. And that was really the bug that I caught. And, you know, I wasn't able to make that venture work, uh, but it's what led to the cannabis side of things. And really my first introduction was uh, a group in Canada that wanted to participate under what was then, I believe, the MMPR. And we basically did some due diligence and some early work for them. Uh, myself and my business partner at the time. And we came back and said, all right, you know, you need to raise, I don't know what the number was, $28 million, let's call it. And they said, that's awesome. You're fired. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> we did a good job here. They're like, no, no. We were told we could do this for 5 million. And of course, if you look at where the market went, that nobody did it for 5 million. But the, that opened my eyes to the fact that there's this disconnect right? Between like the investors and the growers and the reality and the fact that it's farming and all these kinds of things. And that, you know, led to me doing some more consulting and then getting picked up by Urban Grow. And, you know, the, the fun of the fun side of cannabis, right, for me is that there's a lot of money that's being spent on building these facilities and is pushing the technology forward at a really rapid pace. Look at the development of LED lights over the last few years, how fast that's happened. I would say that's entirely because of the investment uh, and the, the, just the number of fixtures being purchased by cannabis producers. Um, and, you know, on the personal side of it, right, when I was working, doing consulting, I was actually working on uh, for a, a high net worth family in New York uh, that was trying to uh, win, win a license in the competitive bid um, process that New York was going through with their medical. And at the time, um, I had a loved one who uh, was sick and was uh, going through treatment for cancer. And, you know, it was very ironic that I was working, trying to obtain this license to grow medicinal cannabis uh, in the state of New York and uh, have dispensaries and all the things that would have come with that license. And I was with uh, my loved one at the doctor and the doctor is writing all these scripts, right? And you know a script is bad when you have to get it on paper these days, right? Instead of just digital fulfillment. Um, and they're writing all these scripts and they write about 10 scripts. And they're like, okay, this is for depression and this is for pain and this is for this and this is for the side effect from the other one and da, 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 da. And this is Marinol, which is really fake, you know, THC and all this stuff. And he gets done, the doctor gets done writing all these scripts and he says, but if it were legal, what I would recommend would be marijuana, right? And for those of you who can't see the video, that's a big wink, right? And, and I was just, I'm sitting there and they had no clue what I was doing for a living. And I'm thinking like, my gosh, here is this doctor who administers chemotherapy to you know, however many tens, tens, twenties, thirties, hundreds of patients a day, a week, whatever, and sees this, this terrible disease, one of many that, that can be positively impacted by cannabis. And he's writing all these scripts because he has to. And then he's giving me a wink and a nod that what we should be doing is going out and scoring a bag of weed. Right. And, and that, as I'm working on getting this like impossible license in New York was like, holy shit, right? Like what is going on in the world? Right. And so what I realized is that I, you know, can take my skill set, right. And my experience and I can apply it in a way that hopefully positively impacts the cost of this product to, to consumers and patients. Right. And so that's where it all kind of crystallized for me. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And I asked that question just because I imagine there's many people out there who haven't yet made that commitment to 
cannabis or cannabis business or who are curious and and maybe still afraid or still don't know if it's really possible or if it's safe or whatnot. So that's why I appreciate hearing those stories from, from people like you who I admire, who are successful and very active in the field. Um, so thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Yeah. And I, I wanted to just really briefly, just on the record, I, I'm noticing this gorgeous Zoom background you have. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to ask you if that's from a site or from a client or, or if you could yeah. tell us a little about that, that scene. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's, well, there's uh, some, some canopy behind me, some flowers, um, you know, for those of you who can't see the video and, you know, back when I was in the field, uh, no pun intended, or maybe there is, I, you know, was lucky enough to, I've been lucky enough to work with some of the best cannabis growers, uh, you know, from coast to coast, right? From, from Cali to, to Maine and East coast and, you know, the South now, you know, in Florida and up into Canada and, you know, every now and again, you walk into a room and I, I, you get somewhat desensitized, right? I, I remember the first time I, I went, you know, this is a long time ago, but the first time I, I walked into a, a buddy of mine had like a 10 light going and I was just like, oh my gosh, like look at all <laughs> look at all those plants, you know, and, and all that light and all the all these all that's going on in here. But you know, now, you know, I walk into hundred light, nine hundred light, thousand light, five thousand, whatever, these big, big, big facilities, you get somewhat desensitized. But man, I can I can I feel like I've I've seen enough and, and learned enough that, you know, I can walk into a room and I can pretty quickly tell if I'm looking at something really special, right? And, um, you know, I used to love to, if they'd let me, of course, you know, if they were okay with it, take a, take a souvenir, a picture uh, of what I was seeing. And, you know, then of course, you know, some of it I've been able to use in presentations and things that I give to say like, hey, look at this canopy management, right? Like, look at, look at what, you know, this effect has or that effect has. And, and um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing cooler than when you walk into a room and, all the plants are just standing at perfect attention. Uh, they look, you know, almost identical, but then you start to get into the, the different strains that are in that room and really observe um, the, the different, uh, you know, expression that the plants have based on, on strain and, and phenotype and these types of things. And it takes me back to, back to my days in early days in college. We had a, uh, a, a girl who was our friend who lived in our dorm and she had an opaque microscope. And uh, I think that's what it's called. And you could put th anything under the microscope, not on a slide, and the way it would just magnify. And the first time I looked at a, a, a nice bud under that microscope and saw that there was a whole world that wasn't visible just to the naked eye, you know, and all the, the, the resin and the glands and the, you know, like you look inside of a bud and there's like liquid, you know, and it's orange and it's purple and it's golden and, and I remember just being fascinated, you know, at 18, 19 years old when we used to do that. Every, every, you know, every bag we got, we used to throw into the microscope to see what was in there. <laughs> nice. A little early R&D and independent A little bit. Study. Yeah. Yeah. A little <laughs> bit of research and development for nice. sure. Well, Mark, I want to, I want to, a couple of things that came up to me, I want to mention. Um, one is I'm remembering from the last time I interviewed you for my book which is available on amazon.com and here it is in the, you know, that's the cannabis business book. I remember you telling me that one thing you really loved about your job and visiting all of these different facilities mm -hmm. was that you constantly were surrounded by people that you could learn from and that you were always asking questions and, you know, whether it was like growers or processors or, you know, anyone, HVAC people, anyone and everyone in between, you're constantly asking them questions and, and learning more and wanting to learn more. And I think it's really evident whenever I speak to you. And part of the reason we've connected so well is because you're genuinely, deeply passionate and curious about cannabis and controlled environment ag. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's just so obvious. And I, I think that it's really important for anyone considering getting into this business that you really need that passion because it's going to fuel 
that curiosity. It's going to fuel that willingness to take on more work and to challenge yourself and to go above and beyond and deeper and, and really will, will fuel your success. And if you don't have that, you're going to eventually come up against the guy like Mark or a guy like me or a gal, like, you know, one of the many brilliant women in this industry that have that passion and they're just going to outwork you and tough it out and out grit you. So, you know, if you don't have that passion, really think twice about getting into this industry. And, you know, the other thing is I, I just think like in an alternate life, if I knew what I knew now, I would go into controlled environment ag. And I just think it's so cool. It's so fascinating. It's completely over my head and beyond my, my scope. Cause I'm not like a big science guy. I'm not a grower, but you know, I like tech, obviously I love mm -hmm. cannabis. So mm -hmm. I, I think it would be a fascinating world to play. And that's why I love being able to chat with you and get these stories. Um, I do want to circle back to a thing you mentioned because I have a curiosity around the, the kind of cannabis tech world versus the ag tech world. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of preface is you know, maybe a year or two ago, I got really into community farming and regenerative small farms and you know, food systems and food inequality. And I, I started doing some learning and education and going to conferences, you know, and going to ag tech conferences. And I had no exposure to that world before that whatsoever. And I was shocked because I had been to, you know, like Seed to Sale and some of the other cannabis grow related mm -hmm. shows. And then when I got into what I'll call the mainstream ag tech world and those conferences and events and ecosystems, it struck me that, whoa, like I, I for whatever reason, assumed that the mainstream ag tech folks would be way ahead of cannabis tech because they were, have been able to do it out in the open for so long and that they would have a more developed ecosystem. And w at least from my kind of uninformed uh, perspective, it really seemed like the cannabis tech world was light years like uh, above and beyond where the mainstream ag tech world was. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear you talk about the LED lights and how cannabis really pushed that technology to develop quickly and to, mm -hmm. to scale up, I, I'm just curious from your perspective as someone who's much more knowledgeable about both of those worlds, how you see those two you know, how, how the circles of those two, uh, of that Venn diagram, you know, compare, contrast, and do, do these people collaborate with the cannabis tech folks very often or not? I, and I'm, I'm just kind of curious about how, how those worlds relate. Yeah. And no, that's a, that's a really, it's an interesting question. And I think, you know, on the cannabis side, there's, there's two things. Uh, there's high risk tolerance by the people involved, right? Whether that be the investors or the operators uh, in the in this in the cultivation side, for sure. Uh, but I think across the board, you see this, right? High risk tolerance. The other thing is availability of capital, right? So there's there's people that are willing to be first, and they have the money to be first. You know, I remember when iPhones first hit the scene. And at the time, uh, I was running a, a different type of business. And I had uh, younger, some young people working for me, right, like high school kids that, that were doing summer jobs. And the one kid, you know, went out and got he stood in line uh, for like a day in, in, to get an iPhone. And he spent a stupid amount of money for a 16 year old kid uh, to buy this iPhone, but he had to be first, right? He had to have that. And so he had you know, whatever it is that made him want to be first for that technology. And he had the cash, he had the capital. And so it, we see that in cannabis, right? And, and so it's the perfect storm for tech development. Because, you know, especially when you look at like innovations around lighting, um, you know, there's a lot of LED that didn't really work, right? And it had to go through this trial and error phase and this development phase, someone's got to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not going to be 
the traditional uh, farmer who is growing a product that has a you know somewhat slim margin, uh, and 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 really you know um, those margins are probably not getting any greater for them. Uh, they're not going to be first to that new product, no matter what the promise of gains or yields or or whatever is. And so, you know, all of the tech that's been developed, whether it's in lighting, whether it's in sensors, right? Sensors is the big thing right now. So it can collect data and we can feed that data to a computer and the computer can make choices and help us uh, optimize. And so all of that's available, right? It's just, I think there's uh, this, I, I think it was a book I read it was called Bridging the Gap, where you've got sort of the, the early, the kid in line getting that first iPhone and paying uh, you know, a good sum to get it. And then there's this gap. And then the next set of adopters, they want proof. They need proof that this works. They need proof that, uh, so there needs to be this whole set of adopters to give them that proof. And so you know, we see where I think we're getting close to that uh, with the sort of more traditional ag side. I've heard and read uh, that there's so with like wine, product, great production for wine, there's a lot of uh, work being done right now around sensors. Uh, and being adopted into that field because if you can predict the outcome of the wine based on the um, based on the environment based on the weather, then you can you know hedge that or or do whatever you're going to do with that batch and that that wine down the road. And so, I think we'll see more and more where it's being adopted as sort of mainstream. Um, but you know, I think the cost on these things also has to come down to where it's reasonable for the crop being grown. You know, it's always been my hope. Uh, one of the things that I get to play with a lot is like water reclamation and recycling of, of water, whether that be wastewater from indoor production systems or whether that be cultivation, use spent cultivation water, or these types of things. And that's something that I can see as being really beneficial long term to traditional ag, traditional horticulture, controlled environment ag. Uh, and But the cost has to come down, right? We have to get these systems to where they're reasonable. And so I think that cannabis um, as an industry is really going to help long term with food production, right? Because we're able to develop these systems, work out the kinks, figure out how they work, get the price points down because we deploy more and more of the equipment. And then we can tap into that knowledge and that understanding and lend it to more traditional, you know, especially food production, which is so critical, as I think, you know, we all know. Uh, you know, the, as the, the population is just exploding, um, you know, and, and our resources are seemingly, you know, I don't know, dwindling or being taxed, you know, more heavily or, or what have you, that these, um, the technology will certainly play a big role in that. So that's always been my, my goal or one of my goals is that I really hope to be in a position, you know, in the next five, 10, however many years to take what I've learned uh, and the experience and translate that over into food production have a positive impact on that as well. Oh, wow. Amazing. Well, I've got some ideas around that, but that, that's a whole other conversation. Um, I'm so, I, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly, which is that it sounds like it's accurate to say that the cannabis sector or industry is really paving the way for ag tech innovation by you know putting in the capital and taking the risk to develop new technology to test mm -hmm. it to refine it and to make it cost effective um and eventually that will move from cannabis we'll say down the food chain i guess to to mm -hmm. food production and other controlled environment ag situations and and perhaps even uh, outdoor, more traditional agriculture. So yeah, absolutely. I think that's what we're seeing, uh, you know, and, and I think that'll accelerate. Uh, you know, it's like um, the, the what we've seen developed from, you know, four years ago, right? Even lighting is always the sort of easy example that people can wrap their heads around, uh, because it's so visual uh, that, you know, HPS or traditional lighting uh, was just the standard as the workhorse, you know, and now we see more and more and more LED. Uh, because of the development that's been uh, occurred in the last four years um, and the refinement of that product and its abilities to deliver. Uh, and we see where, you know, even in gr traditional greenhouses, most traditional greenhouses where they're building even brand new to do tomatoes or peppers or, or whatever they're doing this food production, 
typically it's HID lighting that they're using, right? But more and more, we're starting to see where they're flipping and going over that LED. It's really an ROI uh, discussion, right? And, and that once we get that equipment to a certain price point, that ROI will just be, okay, perfect, boom, and, and we're off. And it'll just become the de facto standard. That's, that's what I see happening, right? Whether that's in the next four years or in the next eight years, I, I'm not really 100% sure, but it's certainly where we're headed. And, you know, um, I think that then the tradition or the transition to outdoor field-grown crops and things of that nature, where you're really going to see that is, you know, IoT, right? Internet of Things, data, sensors, um, the ability to smart irrigate, which is already there, right? It all exists, but it's just how do you get it to a price point so that it's available at different scale, right? It's one thing if you're farming five acres versus 500 acres, 1,000 acres, whatever, right? Uh, and how do we make it work for farmers of, of various different sizes? But I think we're getting there. So I'm hearing that cannabis is helping to save the world in yet another way, which is improving ag tech and facilitating ag tech innovation, which will hopefully make the food that we all eat um, secure, nutritious, and more affordable, which I think is super cool. Uh, Mark, I want to ask you a kind of, uh, I mean, this is of a personal interest of mine. I'm wondering mm -hmm. how much do you know, or how much have you looked at structured water in terms of using that in growed or, or is that, is that on the radar at all? I don't, I don't know what's structured. I, I don't know what that means. Oh boy. Well, now I'm in a pickle cause I don't really know what it means either. But structured water. I, yeah. I, don't, I, I, that's one I'm not familiar with. All right. Well, I will, I will have to, I guess it's according to my friend, Google, it's yeah. magnetized or hexagonal water. Um, so it, it's, it's not H2O. It's like H2, I don't know. It's, wow. it's some, something else. I will hook you up with some, some info on it. And I have a mentor who's like, uh, you know, at the forefront of that world. And so I would be really curious to get your expert perspective on how structured water may play in, in the cannabis and hemp space. Sounds, uh, it sounds pretty far out. You know, the, uh, the thing is, is that there's always, there is this rapid development, right, around water and energy and, and how do we use these resources more efficiently. Um, so we're always looking at what's new, right? The, the thing for me is, is that I'm not an expert. I'm not a chemist. I'm not any of those things. So I rely really heavily on my ability to, to see it, touch it, taste it, uh, you know, I'm very tactile and, and I want to walk into a facility, see whatever the equipment is or the thing is working, and then talk to the people who have to operate it, right? To, to really understand whether it's, it's viable or not. You know, like right now we're talking to a company that's claiming to have essentially an RO, which is a reverse osmosis, uh, water purification type equipment uh, that has zero discharge, which is like the holy grail of that type of equipment. And they claim to be using, I don't know, kryptonite or something, I don't know, something <laughs> like wild that they found, they found it in the earth, or I don't even know, it's a, it's a lengthy story. But, you know, I just said to them, hey, listen, this sounds incredible, right? And as soon as one is operational, let me come see it. You know, I just, that's what I, it's the only way I work. Right, right, right. All right, that makes sense, Well we can connect offline about For sure. the structured water. Cause I'd be curious to, to get your take on it. Anyway, that's, that's a little, a little sidetrack over there. I want to ask you, what do you see as the landscape of cannabis cultivation and cultivation technology right now? Where are things headed? Um, what's top of mind for, for the folks running the really industrial enterprise size grows. Um, has that shifted at all because of COVID? Or, I mean, it seems from what you said earlier, like not that much. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering, like, what is, what's the state of things right now? You know, what, what's exciting in, in, 
in your circles right now? There's a lot. There's a lot to that question. That's a pretty loaded question. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think that before COVID, right, like a year ago, but maybe a little bit more, we were starting to see a cash crunch. We were starting to see where companies that are not making money, uh, the market was starting to react to that. Um, and we were starting to see where projects were not getting the funding that they thought was going to be somewhat readily available uh, to them as their project moved forward uh, and as, as they got licensed and things like that. Um, so we were seeing it a year ago, right? COVID has accelerated that reality. Um, you know, certainly one of the biggest things, right? One of the biggest costs, uh, operating costs for any of these facilities is labor. And I think that that's something that gets missed is that at the end of the day, you know, you can have as, as many people from, you know, consumer, like the big thing right now um, I'm noticing is a lot of companies, vertically integrated companies, but they're hiring people from the consumer packaged goods uh, side of the world, right? From other companies that are CPG um, and they're bringing those people in and, and that's awesome, right? And, and that's needed and that's necessary is the evolution uh, of a fully fledged industry. Um, but at the heart of it, we're farmers, right? At the heart of it, we're growing plants. And, and the, you know, it's, it's dirty and it's sweaty and it's, and it's laborious. And that labor is sort of, you know, a big one, right? Um, you know, we have technologies and things where we're trying to address the power consumption, right? Because how, how much power we suck down is a huge cost, obviously, and, and also has a ripple effect that, that globally that has to be uh, understood and, and managed. But, you know, another big one is labor. And, you know, I think that automation is, is this key piece that, that I'm seeing. I, I actually did a podcast, or not a podcast, but a, a webinar the other day. I did a webinar. And the, uh, on the webinar, I was talking about this. A year ago, I was in Amsterdam for Green Tech, which is, you know, the, the, the show for greenhouse tech, technology and things like that. And so I'm over there, and they had a lot of robotics and one of them was a robotic arm that was picking up uh, rooting material and sticking it into, I think it was like a rock wool tray. And it was a little demo of this, this robot and it had a little camera on it and it could mm. tell whether the, the stock material was uh, valid or not and it would throw it away if it was no good and it was doing all these things. And I posted that on my LinkedIn and I got you know, a really visceral reaction from about 50% of the people, right? about 50% of the people were like, this is terrible. This isn't cannabis. Your people like you are destroying the industry and, and all this stuff. And it was like, okay, you know, on one hand, I kind of get it, you know, I get the passion for sure. Uh, and, you know, especially if you're coming from a point of view of, you know, this may be something that you're, you're linked to because it, it saved your life or it changed your life in, in such a positive way. I get the passion. I get the reaction. But the reality is, is that, businesses that are out of business serve no one, right? I serve no one at, from bankruptcy. So you have to look at it and recognize that if we can employ or deploy technology and automation that, you know, allows us to free up our human resources to, you know, do more human interaction with the plants, right? Rather than just sitting there, you know, picking and plucking and doing these types of things. One of the things we're working a ton on lately is, is automated uh, benching systems, right? Where we're moving plants through these buildings and through these greenhouses, you know, they're robots that come in and pick up a huge tray full of plants and, and move them from one side to the other into a different room and stuff. And it's super cool stuff, you know, and it's all about, you know, reducing the amount of labor. Uh, and I think that's one that, that is top of mind for me anyway, and needs to be as, as the industry develops. Got it. Cool. All right. I want to ask you, what is your superpower? Because <laughs> you've, you've been in this industry for many years. You've consistently, in my eyes, have showed up as a professional in every sense of the word. Every time I've ever seen you at any kind of event or conference or presentation that you've given, whether in person or on the web, yeah, I've always seen you as nothing but professional. And obviously, you've 
grown and succeeded in this industry and continue to do so. So I'm wondering, what is it about you that allows you to get high ROI in the cannabis industry? <laughs> um, you know, I think that it comes from uh, my experience, you know, growing up really, you know, it's, um, I, I was lucky enough to have a, an amazing mother who we, we, we talked about our mothers earlier, um, who was a, a single mom and, you know, who uh, did an awesome job raising me as, and I was, uh, I was a wild kid. I was, I was, you know, went through a period of time where I was, as I would say to my five-year-old, you know, making bad choices. And, you know, I remember I actually, I got arrested uh, when I was like maybe 13 or 14 years old. Um, and, and it was, it was a, you know, just a period of time where I, I was just running with the wrong crowd and, and just, like I said, yeah, making bad choices. And I remember her coming to pick me up from the, the cop shop and, and she's, she's got me by the arm. And, and, you know, I was probably almost as big as I am now back then I was two, you know, 225 and she's like 90 pounds and there, there's no physical reason why she should have been able to grip me as hard as she was. But I remember that grip was super hard. And I remember her saying to me, why can't you learn to play the game? And that has always resonated with me, you know? And I think that's what I've, I've developed is, you know, through the ups and the downs, right? Through like the, the good and the bad. And when I think I got things going well, and when I'm like, shit, you know, I screwed this up. Um, you know, just recognizing that it is a long game. It's a, as, as a, a good friend of mine, like I say, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, and so, you know, having that mindset, right. That what I'm doing is, is playing a very long game, uh, I think has really benefited me, you know, and even in, you know, on the cannabis side of things, because it is a volatile market, it has been right. I mean, controlled environment ag, when I was trying to get into things 10 years ago, when I built Aquavita Farms, um, when I was doing that until now, it has been a pretty bumpy ride, all in all. You know, a lot of ups, a lot of downs, you know, whether it's uh, based on legislation passing or not passing, or a project getting funded or not funded, or, you know, a project manager calling me all pissed off because something didn't ship right or whatever. It, you know, it has been volatile. Uh, and so having that long view has really, I think, served me very well uh, in my ability to kind of stick with it, you know, and, and fall down, dust myself off, get back up and go, all right, you know, I'm getting back in the marathon now and, and just kind of keep going. Awesome. And I actually, in the book, one of the biggest things I say is you have to take the long term approach if you're getting into this industry. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to get burnt out in that, you know, I think I, I, I don't know if I've heard in the book, but I, I, I like to say that in cannabis, you have to sprint the marathon. So it's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I, I want to share a quick story. Uh, I'll give you another quick story about my mother, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I'm an immigrant, my family are immigrants. And mm -hmm. I, a lot of what I learned about American culture was from watching TV. You know, my mm -hmm. parents didn't know, you know, they came from a different world, the former Soviet Union. And so watching TV as a kid, I, there was always like every sitcom had an episode where the kids get arrested, you know, or like the kids <laughs> get in trouble with the law or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I thought that that was like a normal thing that every kid does at some point. And I remember telling my mom one day, I don't remember how old I, I must have been in like elementary or middle school. And I said, yeah, I can't wait to get arrested. And, <laughs> and like, you're going to come get me, right? And mm -hmm. she, I'll just remember, she like got so upset. And she said, what are you, stupid? What are you, an idiot? Like, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. And was just like, how, like, she was appalled. And I was like, yeah, you know, every American kid gets arrested. That's uh, on every TV show, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And she was like, no, 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 don't. <laughs> So that was just a, a funny story that I remember of, uh, you know, me learning how to be an American. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm proud to say I haven't been arrested. So that's, 
Well, it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. Right. I'm okay with that. You know, I think mom was right about that one for sure. (laughs) Yeah. After your mom listens to this podcast, she's going to change her opinion about it. Unfortunately, (laughs) it's, it's, you know, it's a risk of doing business. I'm afraid. Um, (laughs) Mark, I want to ask you two more questions before we shift into the coaching segment which is one, I know that your wife is a coach, or mm-hmm. at least I know for last time we spoke, she was, I don't know if she's still doing it or whatever, but I'm curious what it's like to be married to a coach. And I'll preface that with, I know I sometimes can annoy the shit out of my girlfriend when I'm mm-hmm. too coachy. And, mm-hmm. and at the same time, I know she gets a lot of value and benefit out of having, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, nonstop coaching access to the Mike C mastermind, whatever oh, that is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure she, curious I'm sure she does. Yeah. Uh, well, so yeah, my my wife, uh, you know, her Rebecca Silence. Um, she is a life coach. Uh, she has a, a private practice uh, company called Inspired Results, um, and she's phenomenal. Um, I mean, she, you know, was coaching uh, was working that business uh, when we first met and um, uh, has continued to amaze me uh, over the years. And, and, you know, I think you and I were talking about this right before we sort of started the recording uh, today um, that if you're a coach uh, like you, like she is, and you're, you're not doing the work as it's oftentimes referred to in that world, right? The work. Um, then you're not effective in that role, right? So you've got to be doing the work, not only along with the people you're coaching, but yourself. And so that is probably the biggest thing is that she constantly wants to work on herself and improve and get better. And I'm kind of lazy. I would kind of just like to be in my, you know, like if I'm in a funk or if I'm in my shit, I just kind of like to wallow in it. And, you know, that doesn't fly with her. So, you know, I've had to um, not have to, right? But it's a choice because I want to have this partnership with this amazing woman to try to keep improving myself or try to keep working on myself, you know? I remember, so I did actually uh, Legacy, which is the life coaching certification program that she is certified from. I actually did Legacy five years ago, maybe six years ago at this point. Um, and that was life-changing, right? How I interact with people, how I look at the world, uh, how I'm living, you know, um, and, 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 you know, I don't actively coach or, or use it in that manner, but I try to use the lessons learned in my relationship with my wife, with my children, uh, in my business practices, how am I treating other people? How am I showing up, you know, to this meeting? How am I showing up in this situation, um, you know, uh, as a, as a, an individual and, and from a certain mindset. And so that really, you know, changed things. Um, you know, when I, right when, uh, when Aquavita closed, right, my business, the, the aquaponic farm that I had in Aquavita closed, um, I actually, uh, you know, uh, had some ser- very serious financial ramifications as a result of that, because I was so cl- hard, you know, I was invested in it and uh, so closely tied to the the finances of that company. And I remember right as things were just sort of ending, uh, we had wind, we wound it all down. Rebecca and I went to a seminar by, uh, that was put on by a fellow named Eric Plattenberg, uh, which if you look him up, he's a, an amazing uh, coach and, uh, you know, individual in general, right? And business person. Uh, and we went to this three, four day seminar with Eric and uh, went into an environment where, you know, I learned a ton uh, by just immersing myself in this world of coaching and personal growth that I really didn't know a whole heck of a lot about, right? And then, you know, since then, she's turned me on to like Brendan Burchard and Dean Graziosi and, and some of these other uh, personal growth, you know, individuals who also are running phenomenal businesses, right, uh, as well. And so I've, I've tried to learn from, from people like that as well. But, you know, the big thing is trying to keep up with the rate at which she uh, advances as a, as a human being, uh, is, is tough for me at times. Uh, but I, I do my best to keep up and, 
you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's been, you know, so worth it because we have an amazing, pretty amazing relationship, you know? And I think that, you know, like everyone, we hit our, we hit our shit with each other. Um, but we've gotten to a point where we can move through it pretty quickly, uh, and get to the other side and, and have some resolution. And, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool experience. Cool. Well, that's, uh, I never knew you did the coaching training and I, th I think it's, really important for any leader or for anyone who manages people or works on a team or, or, you know, especially you mentioned with your kids or as a parent, as a partner, it's the, the, the skills, even just the basic coaching skills are something that everyone can benefit from. And it's really like the basics are not that complicated. Um, you know, and, and I, I really encourage people to look into it. And you, you said, something about the work and doing the work and how important that is. And I, I want to take a moment to plug one of my favorite movies, which is a documentary called The Work. And it's, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. And essentially what it is, is uh, there's uh, an organization, a nonprofit that goes into Folsom State Prison and does a bunch of like coaching and trauma healing type work with inmates who are serving like 20 to life, you know, like the, the hardcore guys. Um, and they put them through this immersive, collaborative kind of process. And it's just so powerful to see how much healing and growth these guys get out of it. And it's really something that when I think about cannabis and how many people have been incarcerated, in my judgment, unjustly, you know, as we talk about building the industry and changing the laws and legalizing these these people have been traumatized by you know having to interact with the criminal justice system where i think in a lot of cases the the punishment is much worse than the crime and how do we help all of these people reintegrate into society and move forward in their lives in a healthy productive way uh, and i think the the work that you can see in the movie the work is is a, a potentially really big piece of that puzzle so i would encourage everyone to check that out and uh, just on a personal note i want to mention that before i started coaching anyone and this was now i guess six years ago i went and i got certified and for about six months all i did was work on myself all I did was read books and change my behavior, change my habits, and change everything that I, I thought was really necessary for me to be able to say, hey, I walk the walk. I don't just talk about it, but I've done, I've done the work. I can help you do the work. And so you know, I just wanted to put that out there in case the folks at home are wondering, in case they don't know my story and haven't read the book, um, just, just a slice of the Mike Z pie for you. And on that note, I want to ask you what I've, I've been dying to ask this question, Mark, because I think two of the most controversial words and hilarious words in cannabis are master grower. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard that thrown around and people claiming to be a master grower. And I can only imagine how much you've heard those, those words. And, and I'm wondering... In your opinion, what, if anything, qualifies someone to be a master grower? I, I think that there's, there's something obviously to be said for experience, that, that your level of experience, your years of experience, your scale of experience contribute to being a master of anything, right? Um, I mean, I, I certainly would not use that uh, term to describe myself in any capacity. A master, I'm a master of nothing. Um, I just haven't been doing anything long enough to consider myself that. Um, I have met some growers, some cultivators, right? Some farmers that are certainly masters of their craft and have honed it. Uh, to a, a great deal. Um, I think that the thing that I've noticed is humility. 
anybody, I don't care whether it's, it's growing herb or, or, or working on cars or, or, you know, whatever, uh, being an architect, whatever you do, that, that people that have humility, I think, are at a higher level, right? They're at a higher plane in their craft than those who, who lack it. Um, I, there's a grower, uh, a fella out on the East Coast um, that, that I've worked with on a couple of projects and I've just known for a few years. And um, boy, he's just, he's super humble you know, and, and he's, 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 you walk into his rooms and they are just bursting at the friggin' seams with, with high quality, dense, heavy yield flower, you know, just gorgeous. Right. And, and just on point. And, you know, he's just so humble and he's just um, easygoing, you know, about what he's doing. And, and I think that's kind of the, the thing is that it's a, it's a mindset, right. And being willing it through through having some humility being willing to listen to the experience of others right and and just not assume that we know all there is to know about a certain subject that's really what i look for in anybody you know i i want to know that you know that you don't know something right <laughs> like let's bring everybody to the table let's have an open conversation let's have an open dialogue and let's be willing to learn from one another and i think that's what really make somebody a master at any craft or any, any skill set is their ability to fairly rapidly and easily learn from other people, you know? And I think that all too often growers, cultivators get hired for a skill set called cultivation. And then they get thrown into other roles or they're asked to wear other hats. The classic one that I see all the time is here's my director of cultivation. Uh, and then nobody really says it, but they're also the de facto project manager on a $25 million build out. Well, they weren't hired to be a project manager on a $25 million build out. They were hired to cultivate plants in what will eventually be this thing called a facility. But you're asking them to do things that are outside of their skill set. Therefore, you're setting them up. For, it's a setup, right? Where you're, you're bringing somebody in as one thing, you're asking them to do something else. And then when things don't go quite right or, or whatever, they get blamed, you know? I mean, I can't tell you how often I start a project, you know, and 18 months later or 24 months later when it's up and running, the person that was the grower, right, when it first started is no longer the grower by the time the facility opens. And then within, I'd say, usually 12 to 18 months. So once they get there, they start cycling, that person's gone too. And it, it's not always because they weren't as skilled as they purported themselves to be, it's because they were being asked to do things that were outside of their skill set. They're being set up for failure. And so that's one thing that I always kind of warn people against is like, hey, I don't get so hung up in terms and names and, you know, you call me whatever you want. I, I don't care about title, right? But at the end of the day, what I'm really looking to do is how do we set people up for success? And I think that's what we have to focus on. Got it. Well, I heard a couple of things there, which is one, the big one was humility. And, you know, I think it's necessary to have that humility to learn and to, even if you have the experience to put yourself in the beginner mindset, or even in the student mindset, and to keep adding to the craft. And uh, there's two books that I love, both called Mastery, one by Robert Green, and the other, I don't remember the, the gentleman's name off the top of my head, but he's an Aikido master. Mm. who it's a short book it's an amazing elegant you know he clearly has a mastery of writing in my opinion because it's such a small book full of so much wisdom and I'll, I'll link to both of those too um but mark you're totally right that you know there's no substitute for the experience you know to get the ten thousand hours and then get ten thousand more and then you're really like super super whiz level of whatever your craft is. Um, all right, cool. Well, that being said, I want to shift gears into the coaching segment, which I'm tentatively calling in into the weeds with Mike Z. I don't know. I'm just trying that on today. The next time like it, it might be different. All right. Yeah, I like it. I'll go with right. that. All right. Into the cool. weeds. Let's get into the weeds. The weeds. <laughs> yeah, yep. we'll go in the weeds. Uh, and so, Mark, 
I want to offer you what I feel is the highest form of support and value that I can give you today is a little bit of coaching. And what, what I want to ask you is what is your biggest business challenge right now? Or even if, if it's not a business challenge, what's on your mind as a sticking point or roadblock today? Mm. Mm. So the thing that I've professionally that, that's been coming up for me is that I see from my vantage point fairly clearly this disconnect that I identified years ago that still exists in the industry. And that is the disconnect between the realities of farming and the investment that's flowing in. Um, and it manifests itself or in my, you know, from my viewpoint is manifesting itself in lost business, lost money, uh, you know, bad budgets, uh, all these, these things, right. That are just costing the industry, costing the industry time, costing the industry money. Um, and, and this disconnect I've tried to explain whether it's on stage, you know, giving a presentation, whether it's on a webinar, like I did the other day. And I'm trying to explain it because I just want it to, I just want people to stop. I just want people to stop screwing up. Like, and I just want them to recognize that there's this disconnect and, and how to get past it. Right. Because it's not like, I'm just saying, Hey, there's this issue. I'm also trying to say, Hey, there's this issue and here's some, some solution. Here's how you get beyond it. Um, so that you don't end up going out of business. Right. And I feel like it's not landing as my wife, the, the life coach would say, it's not landing um, with, with the audience, with the people, right. That it needs to land with. And I feel that it's probably because I'm emotionally charged around it because I went bankrupt on my first controlled environment egg facility. And what I'm wanting to work on is how do I separate that so that I can get the message to land and have the impact of improving things overall? Um, and, and you know, does that make sense? Yeah. So what I'm hearing is you have spotted a problem in the industry that you feel you have some solutions for, and you've been trying to get people to hear you and see this problem and try something different so they avoid going down a path that you went down of failing in their business or going bankrupt in, in a business and maybe taking not the most efficient path. And at the same time, it seems that because you have some emotional charge around the issue, maybe you're, you, I, I'm hearing a judgment for you that maybe you're, communicating it with too much emotion and because of that it's not landing that's that's it yeah yeah and and i would just say that perhaps the emotion comes off as um like snarkiness or uh like an attitude uh, like an air of superiority uh or you know just that piece of it right because it is emotionally charged for me um it, it makes me sound like an ass, right? And that's, that's what I'm wanting to avoid. Got it. So I'm hearing that this is a very interesting and complex piece that you've brought me because I'm hearing a couple of different angles. Um, one, I, I guess I'm wondering, like there's a couple of ways I could challenge you here. One is, is it really the emotion that, that is in the way of this landing or is it something else? I guess, let, let me take a step back. Who's the audience for this message? Really, I think, you know, it's investors. It's those entering the, the, the business, right? Entering the business of cultivation. Um, you know, the owners, right? Who are 
trying to put something together, the entrepreneurs uh, in, in the space, right? Cultivators in the space. So that, that would be the, the primary audience uh, of, of people that I want to, I think that it would have value in the message. And what is the message in, in as succinct and brief uh, as possible? Can you just tell me the message? That there's, a, that there's a disconnect which exists between the investment side and the cultivation side when it comes to the design, build, and operation of cultivation facilities. What is it? Tell me more about the disconnect itself. Um, investors uh, and those starting overlook the, the, that it's a holistic project, right? That all the parts and pieces relate back to the whole. And, and have to be carefully considered and weighed against one another, right? Where, where I see people making mistakes is through this like design build phase of these facilities and the, they end up with operational and financial fatigue by the time they get started and it ripples through everything else. So the, the disconnect that exists at the outset of the project, right? I, I mean, I was, I'll give you an example. I was talking to a, wealthy guy at a, at a wedding last year out East. Um, and the wealthy guy, we were at a reception in an old mill building where they'd built a, a bar and, and distillery in this old mill building uh, in, in Massachusetts. And he says, oh, you know, don't they turn these buildings into grows? And I said, yeah, you know, we got some of that. And he goes, oh, it must be, you know, you, what, you just throw some lights in the room and throw the plants in the room and ah, oh, it's great, you know? And he legitimately thought that was real, right? And it's so much more nuanced and complicated than that, you know? And it's the, you know, because it's a million decisions and parts and pieces, that's where I see people sort of screw up on the front end. And then that carries through to where, you know, 18, 24, 36 months into operation, they're still struggling, right? Staffing is struggling. Um, you know, frustrations run high. You know, uh, one of the things I always say is, you know, I can't believe how frustrated some of these people are. You grow weed for a living. Like, you should be pretty happy. Like, something wrong here, man. Like, you know, if you're having more bad days than good, you're doing something wrong, bud, because, you know, look at what you do for a living. But, you know, how, how, do, we, how do I take that message and get it out there so that it, it lands? You know, I, that, that's the thing that's been a stumbling block, you know, for me. Um, I, I hear you. And help me understand why do you care? What does it matter to you if, let's say, Joe Investor and, you know, Steve Cultivator get together and they haven't done their homework or they, they're, they're not seeing the whole picture and, mm -hmm. you know, they throw a project together that ends up burning out or going up in smoke or sure. whatever pop pun sure. I can conjure yeah. up. You know, what does it matter to you? Uh, there's two things. So the first is, I said it earlier, right? Uh, a broke business serves no one. So, it, you know, a bankrupt business can't serve patients, can't serve consumers. And, and you know, at the end of the day, I believe that, that cannabis is medicine, regardless of what the government calls it, regardless of what your governor calls it, uh, regardless of what it says on the front of your store, right? Um, that everybody uses it the same way everybody uses medicine. And, and so if you're out of business, you, you can serve no one, right? Uh, and if you're struggling you, you, to maintain your business, you, you can serve people, but not at a high vibration and not you know, ultimately successfully, right? So alt at the beginning of it, it's really you know, patient and consumer focused. There's a part of that. The other part of it is that there's real people involved. So, you know, I was sitting at a dinner one night. I took some customers out to dinner. And at the dinner was the gentleman who was starting the cultivation facility, a couple of guys who work for him, and he was there with his wife. And he was spouting all this stuff that I knew to be untrue, that I knew was inaccurate about finances, about timelines, right? And through that whole dinner, all I could think was, is your marriage isn't going to survive this. Mm. And it weighed heavily on me. I still think about it. It was like two years ago. I can still 
see them sitting across the table from me and her looking at him as he is all in with bad information. And I'm thinking, this will destroy you. This will destroy what you have. It's not worth it. You know, and it really broke my heart. And so, you know, there's, there's really, it's twofold, right? It's just rececognizing that whether we call that person an investor or an owner or a grower or whatever, they're real people with lives and families and, and things to do, you know, and lives to lead. And then on the other side of it, we have patients and, and customers who rely on safe product at a, at a decent price. Yeah. And I'm curious, I, I sense that you're, you, you have some emotion, even just saying all that. I'm wondering what, what are you feeling right now in this moment? Yeah, I guess it's passion um, is, is part of what I feel. Right. And, and, you know, I guess to this, a little bit of what it felt like when I, I invested everything I, I had at the time. Right. And then lost it. It well, takes what, me back to that. And what did that feel like? Boy, you know, it felt like failure. It, it felt, you know, like shame. It, it felt like, um, uh, I guess those are the two best ways to describe it. Really failure and shame, you know, um, set out to do this thing that felt great, that felt real, that felt, you know, energizing and so many people bought into uh, only to have it not work out uh, was, was terrible. Um, and, um, you know, it took a long time to kind of rebuild from there. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you say the, there's a feeling of shame and like, like failure and I'm, I'm seeing and sensing some sadness as you mm -hmm. remember that and talk about that. Um, and so what I'm kind of seeing here overall is that why this message is important for you to get out there is because you want to protect people from going through that experience of that, that you've had of, you know, maybe going all in or not knowing exactly the right setup or something along those lines and, and failing or um, losing or, you know, whatever it may have been, or however you think of it and, and having that feeling of failure or shame. Mm -hmm. it, does that sound right? How's that landing with you? Yeah. Yeah, no, that lands. I mean, it's, it's, it's all of that. It, it's, it's right. Wanting people. It really is. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's looking at the, the entrepreneur and the, and the people entering it and, and just not wanting to, I, you can't save anybody, right? You can't prevent anybody from having the experience they're going to have, but at least being able to share openly the information, not only by that in, my experience that informs it today, right? My, my experience all those years ago, but then everything I've learned in the last five years, really, uh, that I can say, Hey, here's all the stuff to look out for. Right. Um, because I don't, I don't want people to, to, try to do something great in the world and, and suffer as a result of it. You know, if I, if I can help avoid that, I mean, why, you know, right. I mean, I, I'll give the information away for free. Just, just don't, just don't fuck up. Like really, I mean, you know, but, but how do you get it? You know what, again, like, how do I get it to land? Because so often it seems like I try to present the information in different formats and it, it just isn't hitting. So, I, that's a whole other conversation of how to, I'll, I'll give you the spark notes version of the answer to that question of how to get it to land. And my gut as a storyteller is just be as honest and, and vulnerable about that feeling. Cause to me, it sounds like it's really, you know, that feeling quite well, I would venture to guess of the, that, that feeling like a failure or, or that shame of, you know, hey, I was just trying to do something great. I gave it my all. It didn't work out. You know that feeling. And I think if you could communicate that feeling and just say, hey, I don't want you to go through this. And so, you know, hear me out. And if I can save you that pain, great. And if you go on and, you know, make your choices anyway, then that's on you. 
but at least I tried. You know, I think because to your point, you can't protect everyone, you can't save everyone, and people have to, people are going to go and make their own choices and run their own businesses and live their own lives. And, you know, however that ends up is, is on them. It's, it's, well, it's not on you. So Mm -hmm. that's the spark notes there. But I'm wondering to go back, um, you know, I, I hear that you genuinely care about these other people, strangers even, it sounds like, who might be investors or entrepreneurs or cultivators that are getting into this and taking a big risk and you know, hopefully with good intentions of wanting to do something good for the world. And so I wanna ask you, what kind of person, what kind of man cares about the well-being of, of strangers going after their, their goals or their dreams or, or whatnot? What kind of person cares about those people? Well, that's a tough one. That, that's, geez, I don't, I, don't, I don't quite know how to answer that. I, I mean, I guess it's, you know, maybe it even goes back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, doing the work. Uh, and, and one of the things that came of my experience, you know, in, in various seminars and various things that I've done is really looking at like ripple effect. Right. And that's one thing that I, I'm really conscious of, um, in my own experience is the ripple effect and like the ripple effect of my decision. Right. So my decision uh, to be in this industry, I wanted to have a positive ripple effect on uh, as far out as that ripple will go. And I have no way of knowing how far out it goes or who it's going to touch. So I really think, I mean, possibly to answer the question, it's, it's someone who cares about that ripple effect, cares about, you know, what my words and my deeds and my actions, how are they going to affect somebody who I may never know? Uh, and then what effect is that person going to have on, on someone else? Right. Um, you know, I, I look at, you know, back to that, that day with the, the doctor saying, you know, Hey, if it, you know, if I could, if it were me, I would, you know, be recommending this, um, you know, what was the ripple effect that was created by that? And then what was the, the, the effect of being in a state where that wasn't available, right. Where you couldn't legally buy cannabis you know, and so uh, other avenues had to be approached. And, you know, I, I just, I want to have a positive impact. And, and this is the area where I, I see that as something I can viably do, right? I, I mean, that's, that's it, you know? So I, I'm hearing that it's, you would describe that person or a person like that as someone who cares someone who wants to have positive impact. Give me some more of what kind of person cares about strangers and wants, wants to help others succeed and wants to have positive impact and wants to be conscious of their words and actions. And how would you describe a guy like that? I, Jeez, that's it's really that's that's hard for me to get to. I'll be honest. Like, there's a major like block, right? I mean, it's hitting a brick wall. Uh, I I I would think that it's like the person who I would aspire to be. Like, I wouldn't even describe myself that way. So tell me about you know. Tell me about that guy. I, 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 I mean, see, I guess I, I guess that, that guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I guess that guy, you know, is is um, showing up in the world doing doing the the right thing doing the right thing by, by his, his fellow man and woman and just trying to make the world a better place and, um, you know, showing love and empathy uh, to the world, right? I mean, I, I think it, it, that might be it, right? They, that that person has love and empathy for everyone, you know? Um, you know, uh, I remember we went to see the Dalai Lama speak one time and, and he, his, his love and empathy was, was the whole thing, right? Like 
his love and empathy for the entire world was, uh, was amazing, right? Mind blowing and drew all these people to him. Um, and not saying that, that I could ever aspire to that, but boy, you know, I, I could, I just want to be as, as, as giving as possible, you know, and, and give whatever has been given to me uh, as freely as possible, you know, to, to try to have a positive impact, you know, um, and it's a, it's a cool way to be able to do it, right? Because I've seen the positive impact that this plant can have on people's lives um, from a health standpoint. And um, it, it changes you, you know? It's one thing to be a, a young person, um, as they say, I hate the term recreationally consuming, uh, but consuming for fun, right? It's another thing to see it impact somebody who's, you know, uh, very, very ill. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's it, right? Like that's, there's all this money and there's all this bullshit and there's all this hype, right? Around all this, this whole thing. And it's not what it's about. It's about farming this plant, right? That, that should be treated in a sacred manner. And at the same time can pay your bills probably pretty well, right? Like let's not be flipping about that reality. But, you know, if we don't care about the impact, we don't care about the ripple, um, if we don't care about the energy around it, then it, it's, it doesn't work, right? As, as Eric Plattenberg taught me, if you come from a low vibration or a low state, as he would call it, then you can make things happen, but they're not sustainable, you know? And so, you know, I just want to try to show that love and empathy where I can. Um, I would describe that, that person that we're talking about, who may or may not be me, um, as, as, caring and, and loving and empathetic. Um, yeah. So I would describe them. And thank you. And I would add from what I heard from you, generous. And I would offer you the word that came up for me in hearing you is, and a word I love because I associate it with cannabis is compassionate. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I want to invite you and challenge you because I see that uh, there's a part of you that feels uncomfortable owning your goodness and your power. And I saw it earlier when I asked you, what's your superpower? You kind of, you took a very, you know, I, I don't know if it was an intentional, like, you talked about humility and you took a very humble approach of, oh, I don't have one. I, you know, I'm just, I, I, I don't have mastery of anything. I'm just the guy kind of thing, which, mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it was interesting for me to see that. Um, so I, I want, I want to check something out and I, I want to invite you, well, actually, I'm going to stay there. I'm going to, I want to invite you and challenge you to, to own those qualities about yourself. And that could very simply sound like, I am, you know, caring, loving, generous, uh, what, what, you know, the words that you, you gave me earlier. So are you willing to, to step into that energy, take a deep breath if you have to, take a, take a hit of those words and, and tell me, tell yourself, tell the audience, mm -hmm. I am, you know, X, Y, and Z. I think, I think you should, instead of in the weeds, you should call it the hot seat. Um, <laughs> although I think that one's taken by a couple of different people. Um, yeah, I mean, I can get there. I, you know, I can say, you know, that's hard. It is hard, right? It is hard. It's like the, you know, you ever had anybody tell you to do that in a mirror? Look in the mirror, right? And tell you, I love, I love you in the yep. mirror. Yeah, that's freaking yep. hard, man. Um, but yeah, I can say I'm, I'm love. I am compassion. I am, I am, you, you know, for the, I'm love and compassion for this industry. That's, that's what I would say. Right. And, and I, I do feel that. And I, and I want, I, that's what I want to be in the world. So I'm going to invite you. I, I guess my, my internet must've cut out or something. What? I'm, I'm, Come on. I, I'm, I'm going to need you to, can you repeat that for me? You are what I am. 
I am love and compassion. Take a deep breath of that. Take a hit of that. What, what does that feel like? What does that um, feel like? Well, it's it's got a big smile on my face. You know, that does. It, it feels good, man. You know, it feels good. Um, it's 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 changing. I can I can feel that change right in the mindset. You know, um, yeah, it's so much better. It's it's that state. It's so much better to come from love and compassion and and. Um, a high vibration than it is to come from, boy, this, you know, this felt like shame or this felt like failure. Boy, that's, uh, that's absolute. Nice. And yeah. so I'm, I'm going to shout out Tony Robbins, who he talks about, you know, the, the, the formula for success is having the right state stories and strategies, and maybe not in that order. I think it's stories state and strategies or i'm not sure but i i hear you talking about your state and i, and I want to just comment on the story for a moment mm -hmm. um because i my sense is that there's still within you is that part of you that feels like a failure or has that pain or shame of of not succeeding in your first business or whatnot. And I, 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 my, my guess is that every once in a while that'll get triggered, you know, and, and, and you'll feel that again. And maybe you'll, if you're like me, you'll beat yourself up over it. And, and, you know, the shame is easy to spiral out of control and, and get stuck in that. Oh, I'm no good. I'm, you know, I'm this, that, and the other and, and all that stuff. So is that true? Is that, does that resonate for you at all? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's easy to get stuck in it. Right. It's, um, and I think it does have to do with what I'm telling myself about the, the story. Right. Right. Or, right. or what's triggering me. Right. right. Where, what the trigger is. Um, you know, certainly like that example or that story I told about being at dinner with the, the man and his wife and the, the, the deep impact that my thoughts. Right. I mean, and of course that was my projection right? Completely bullshit. You know, I mean, they, they could be fine right now. Like they could be no big deal. Um, but because it had such a, the, my business closing, you know, uh, was such a struggle for my own relationship. Right. But then I'm projecting that. Right. So I, I recognize that I have to get out of projecting the story for right. sure. You know? Right. Um, and I, the, the more I think about it, the more I'm thinking that like what I love about what you're saying is, is it's kind of like I need to reset the, I, I need to do a reset before I'm talking about it, before I'm interacting uh, with my experience or with other people, you know, and, you know, sort of like, a, you know, a little mantra, right? Coming up with like a little mantra, like, I'm love, empathy, compassion, and gratitude for this industry prior to getting on stage or prior to uh, doing a webinar or webcast or podcast, whatever, right. I think is actually something that I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to using. All right. Well, cool. It sounds like that's a strategy that you can pull away from this. Yeah, for sure. I want to, I, I want to go back to the story for a second. Cause I think mm -hmm. there's a, a really critical piece here to, mm -hmm. to, to tie, tie it all together, which is, um, you know, and, and just tell me if this feels true for you is that on some level you still believe that story sometimes of I'm a failure because, or, or, or feeling that shame because whether the business didn't work out or for, for whatever reason it might be, is that a thing that feels true? Has that happened for you? Or I'd say it can happen for it sure. Can. Yeah. So, it can so, happen. So what I, what I want to invite for you to do is is to change the story a bit and um and kind of you know and i'm sure you've I, i'm guessing that you've done this before in in some other ways or I mean, maybe not but you know rewrite that story or, or, or to borrow kind of what you said earlier today is like, take that really long view, mm. right, of 
that story, that was the start of your story, or maybe that wasn't, that probably wasn't even the start of the story, but really that was just an early part of the story that, you know, an early part of your journey that allowed you to get to the point that you're at now. And although in some ways you might've viewed it as a failure or maybe viewed yourself as a failure, you know, that actually had a lot of positive impact. You know, I'm sure it has negative impact too, because it's not nice to feel like a failure or to, to beat yourself up, you know, and, and I would encourage you to, to, to give that up if you can. Um, but, you know, I'm sure along the path, your, your drive for improvement, your commitment to education and professional development you know, in some ways was born or, or nurtured from that quote unquote failure. Yeah. It, and yeah, I, I'm totally, I, I'm totally agreeing with you. Um, you know, I think 90%, 90% of the time, 99% of the time that that's right where I am at, you know? Um, and, and then there's, I think it's, I just need to be more conscious of that one to 10% of the time where whatever it is, it's triggering me, um, makes me flip, flip the script on that story. Right. And, um, you know, causes it to come through in that way. So, yeah, I, I think you're, you're a hundred percent correct. Um, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, for whatever reason, there's something that from time to time will just flip it on me. So I gotta be more conscious of that. Oh, I think that's, uh, that's called being human. <laughs> yeah yeah and that that's the other part of it too for sure yeah right 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 so i and and luckily there's a plant that i know of that is really good at state change it's, <laughs> it's like amazing for state change and perspective shifting so ayahuasca <laughs> that one too that's a <laughs> you know that's that's a more that's a more potent you know uh, <laughs> Yeah, oh, indeed. That, that'll shift more than your state. That, uh, indeed. That'll yeah, put you in a different universe. <laughs> yeah, that'll shift your whole mindset for sure. Yeah. That's the hard reset, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, yeah, you're unplugging and replugging. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. A couple of times. Oh, yeah. man. Mark, I want to ask you, what was the most valuable part of our call or, or the most, the, the, the greatest insight from the coaching portion of of this conversation? I mean, for me, the coaching portion, without a doubt, you know, was talking through, right, the, to get to that point where I could say what you were asking me to say, right, and and kind of having that revelation that I need that, that hard reset prior to trying to, uh, you know, talk to somebody or, to, or tell uh, a piece of my story to try to help them. Right, so that I'm coming from the right state. Yeah, that that was actually pretty substantial. It's it's something that I've I've kind of locked in now that I'm gonna actively practice that um, using a that that sort of like mantra as I said, you know, prior to those engagements. And I think that'll that'll be really beneficial. Nice, yeah. awesome, and I would yeah. encourage you, even though you kind of joked about it. And I'm going to put this in my, in my next book, because I think this, I'm such a big believer of this, which is, and I think cannabis is great for facilitating this, which is, you know, it, it's hard, it's uncomfortable, but it's, I believe, so valuable to spend some time looking in the mirror and telling yourself, then this is something I do. I'm, I'm not embarrassed to admit it. This is, and, it, and it's great if you have a little bit of cannabis first to facilitate it. It makes it a little more silly and fun and playful. It's like, go look in the mirror and tell yourself those nice words of affirmation and that story of whatever it is that you may need to hear to be more inspired or to get to a higher state and to, to really to ingrain that story into your unconscious mind into your operating system mm -hmm. of because it's so easy for those stories to get in there and we don't even know you know for example in in your situation 
there might be that that story somewhere deep inside of I'm a failure, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, I, I would I would be willing to bet by, you know, 90% of the time, at least for you. And I, I bet if I ask 90% of, you know, 100 random people, they would all agree that that's just not true. <laughs> you know, that it's just almost laughable, that story. Right. Sure. So, but on the flip side, how much time do you spend or do I spend or does the average human being spend telling themselves the positive, affirmative, you know, stories that are going to, uh, stories of self-love and self-compassion and self-acceptance that are actually going to inspire and lift them up and build them up to, to achieve their highest potential. And uh, my guess would be that 90% of people never do that or do it not nearly enough. And so I think it's a great exercise, actually, if you're listening at home, I challenge you with cannabis or without, spend four minutes and 20 seconds just giving yourself the googly eyes in the mirror or, or telling yourself, you know, pretend you're, this is the, the, the kind of framing that I've been thinking of, how do I make this fun and accessible is like, mm. pretend you're like drunk at a bar or something, and I hate using alcohol, but pretend you're a little tipsy and you like spot that really sexy, attractive, amazing person, and you're feeling all the confidence in the world and you're trying to, you know, flirt or whatever, do that with yourself in the mirror for just four minutes and 20 seconds and compare how you feel before and after. And I can guarantee you that nine times out of 10, you'll feel much better. And then the ripple effect of that will be more joy, more acceptance, more energy, less pain, less anxiety, more effectiveness. And it's really quite simple. It doesn't cost anything. You know, it's, it's, I don't know. That's my invitation to anyone listening at home. And, you know, the, and the, the caveat I'll give is do it when you feel good so that when you feel bad and the resistance is 10 times greater, then it won't feel as challenging or difficult. And you'll already say like, Hey, I, I, I can do this. I know what I need. I know if I do this, it'll, you know, in five minutes, I could get out of this or, or get towards a better state of being. So that's my, that's my homework for everyone listening at home. And feel free not to do it because, you know, I'm not responsible for you. And, <laughs> and, and that's okay. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Oh, man. Mark, thank you so very much for, first of all, spending the time with me. Second of all, just being an awesome guy and being vulnerable and showing up. And like I said before, I've only ever seen you show up with integrity and professionalism. And I think you lead by example. And I think you did that here today. And I'm honestly just proud to know you. And it's always a pleasure to chat with you and to learn from you and to be able to ask you about all the cool weed growing stuff. I have <laughs> way more questions, but that'll be for another day. Um, so thank you for being here. And before I let you go, I want to know if, if there's anything we didn't touch on or cover, if you have any closing parting words for, for me and the people, mostly for the people, um, although I'm all ears, of course. So, you know, I just wanted to give you a chance to, to, to close us out or share anything that, that you feel like sharing. Oh, thanks. I, I you know, I'm, I'm honored to, to have uh, done this with you. I mean, it's been awesome, you know, reconnecting uh and and seeing you uh and and um you know i appreciate the coaching i really do i think that um i think that you are are leading by example as well in in having a format like this where people can be uh, a little bit more vulnerable a little bit more honest right i think that's it's what the world needs and so you know i'm i'm grateful that that you invited me and that you allowed me to participate um i, I think only great things can come of, of open dialogue and, and honesty. So thank you so much for creating this, uh, this format. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking forward to, to watching you continue to grow and expand and, and uh, yeah, I just, just can't be any more grateful. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Mark. And 
who knows, maybe five, 10 years from now, we'll be growing food all over the world together in some, in some That'd be crazy awesome. way. That'd yeah. be awesome. <laughs> awesome, man. To it. Cool. Well, thanks again, Mark. Uh, much respect and appreciation for you. And, and you know what? Just keep on being you, brother. Keep thanks, bringing man. that love and compassion to the cannabis world. You know, that's the example that cannabis teaches us. And as long as we follow that example yeah. the best we can, I believe things will turn out okay. Yeah. Right on, man. Awesome. Thanks so much. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The cannabis business coach. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The cannabis business coach.